Hi again. In this video, I will show you how to take a log, a maple log in this case, and turn it into a little stack of usable materials that we can then turn into bluebird houses. So far, this is the blueprint that I've come up with. It's a combination of lots of ideas that I found on the internet and some of my own uh, ideas and quote improvements. But we'll see how it goes. As I move forward with the process, I'll likely make some adjustments and as I do, I'll tidy this all up into a printable sheet that you'll be able to find down in the description. The hardest part will be finding some logs, you'll need a chainsaw, and the most expensive part are the screws. Try to find some exterior grade 2 inch screws. This material is something around 11 sixteenths. It's wet, it's green, so expect it to split, but that's okay. You want it to split so that it breathes. You also don't want your cuts to be too perfect. I table sawed these and it was probably too perfect. You want a little bit of air to get in it and light. Usually the wood that you would buy at the store has already been killed and dried and so it won't split. It's very stable. This will shrink and split and that's okay. The birds won't mind, I promise. But when you're done, you're going to have a solid maple bluebird house and there's no paints, stains, chemicals, anything in it that would be dangerous or prohibitive to bluebirds nesting in this box. I hope you enjoy this video. The longest board on the birdhouse is 16 inches. So for that reason alone, I'll have to cut a 16 inch log, but the rest of them are all pretty short. So I'll cut one 16 and a couple of 12s. I'm using my smaller chainsaw. It's a 170, and the reason for that is because I find it easier to control when you're trying to mill small logs. The chain on it is also quite dull. There's our tree. So you don't have to point that out to me. I prefer it dull in this case because I find that it's less aggressive. In fact, the rakers are tall on this blade because it's so dull. Chain. I know some of you get upset if I say blade, even though the chain is filled with little blades. Well, I love this little chainsaw because it's easy to control. And as I was saying, these things, these rakers, are in between the little teeth. And they kind of act like depth setters. So as you lose material in your teeth, they go, the teeth go down, that leaves the raker sticking up high, and it allows you to cut less deep. Now with normal cross cuts, that would be a bad thing, and you would struggle. But for what I'm doing, trying to use this as a little more of a precise cutting tool, uh, it'll be good, but this is still probably too dull. We'll find out though.
easier to read a naked log. Let's take a look. See how it's shaped like an egg? We want to get the... We only need six inches this way. But we want to get as much material this way as possible. So we'll start by putting a flat spot here. At the very end right here, it should read six inches if I square up. And same thing over here. And you can see that I'm shorter this side. So I need to move my line a little bit to accommodate. I'll move it down like this. That's, all of this is not so important because I have such a huge amount of material to work with here. But if you want to be picky and maximize your log, then think symmetry. But we're working with an egg here, so that'll be good. Well, it takes practice, but that's pretty good. It definitely helps, as I've said, to have a dull chain, a slightly dull chain, so it's not too grabby. But let's take it back to the shop now, and we can really make it pretty there. And let's take this. It's not just firewood, as long as it's six inches at least, we can use it for a roof especially if it's pretty and symmetrical. I'm actually rather pleased with myself for that. I mean, I don't really have to plane it. Not for this project. It can't hurt. It will only make the next step easier. But I have to say, using a plane on wet material is really tough. It really sticks. Okay, that's good enough. It's fun until you have to sharpen your block plane. The combination square is set to six inches, and the first thing that I have to do is mark it all out. The power saw's depth has been set to one inch deep, and that will make just a shallow cut, just enough to provide a channel for the chainsaw chain to kind of snap into. The goal is to keep us on the line. connect these two cuts and we're not going to lose sleep if we're not perfect because we already did a really good job on the first cut. I know straight is in there somewhere. Now I have to chainsaw it again and the trick is to make a slice that's a plane and this will be a recurring theme in this video 
that theme is multiple perspectives. Keep walking around and get a different view. Like you want a view from all angles, from every perspective that you can imagine. And that will help to keep it straight as you go forward. It's not as tough as it may look. It's just a game of minor course corrections and patience. This part will take a little bit of judgment, which is a combination of measuring and head scratching. I'm marking every three quarters of an inch, and I'm not making an allowance for the blade. So all of these pieces will be three quarters minus whatever the blade cuts away. This last one is still usable material. We're making birdhouses, not space shuttles. Don't square them all down, just square one. This is our reference line. We'll use that to mark from, and then once both sides are marked, we'll connect the lines together. Just to be clear, I, this one set of lines goes all the way around, and it's my reference mark. I will pull all of my measurements from that. Do not skip this step. It was maybe the second or third log that I was doing, and I didn't bother to do this. And it was a disaster, because my power saw was out of square and I didn't know it. This will alert you to any problems while you're cutting, and you'll get a much neater result. have to keep your blade on the same side of the pencil line every time. That mistake there, I'll blame on the camera. One side down and one to go. The only mistake I made so far was just that one. The most important thing to do is in between every cut, check both front and back that you're running parallel to those pencil lines. Even if you're off the line a little bit, as long as you're running parallel, everything will be okay. Not my best work, but I can make it work. To begin construction, we start with one of the long pieces, three of the short pieces, and one slab. The long piece comes in at around 16 inches. It doesn't have to be perfect. Nothing here does. Don't apply a human standard to bluebirds. They don't care. 
And then as soon as I say that, my natural preference for precision takes over. <laughs> uh, okay, look for a piece that has this thickness left from the milling process in the middle. And that's the thickest piece we have we want to use for our front face because you want your hole to be thick so that bigger birds don't enlarge the hole and take over the bluebird nest. So this will be the front piece, we'll set it aside. These will be the left and right side pieces and we'll pick the straighter edges and put them to the middle. And then we'll put a slope on each of these pieces like that facing away from one another at seven and a half degrees. This is really easy if you have a quick square like this. Keep the pivot point there, rotate it around until the lowest set of numbers, these degrees down here, are seven and a half. That would be in between five and ten. Right there. Now you trace the top edge. And there it is. For the corresponding piece, flip your square this way, make it that way. But you don't really have to do that at all. Just hold the two straight sides together, the straight edges rather, and we can cut both of these at the same time. It might be hard for you to notice because of perspective, but I'm keeping the longer side against the fence. I still didn't cut these to length. The length is actually 10 inches from the short point to the end, or 10 and 7 eighths from the long point to the end. So, mark down this edge, 10 inches, square it, and cut it off. And yes, you can save a whole bunch of steps if you just measure to both points and cut, and then you don't have to play around measuring the slope. There's usually more than one way to walk around a tree. And while we're here, we can cut just a 10 inch square piece and this is our front piece. Here's our front piece, it will get the hole. Here are our side pieces. And this is our 16 inch back board, the base. Coming back to the front, we'll measure down from the square cut we just made, two and a quarter inches. Two and one quarter. Now find the center, and that should be right around three inches if you're using six inch material. And that little point will be where we drill our one and a half inch hole. Sure it burns, it's wood. You wanna see? All that's left is to cut the slab to length and to make the floorboard. Take note that the internal dimensions here are four and a half by five and a half because of the material considerations. Ideally, you would want it to be five by five, but hey, at least the rent's cheap. We can go ahead and cut the roof piece at ten and a half inches for length right now, 
but the floorboard will have to wait until it's all screwed together. The front and the back are the same width as the roof piece. Therefore, I want to hold the side pieces in just a little bit when I'm screwing it all together. And that will create just a little lip, like a little bit of an overhang that will help keep water out. Okay, pay attention to how I arrange the pieces because the first screw is always the hardest. You don't need to elaborate on that quip. Take this one, put it perpendicular to this one, and now we can use that to keep the whole thing from falling over as we put our first two screws in. The goal is to be somewhere around flush here with a lip on this side. And experience has taught me that every time I put a screw in, I first drill a pilot hole. Don't put these screws too close to the top or else once the roof is on, you'll have difficulty getting the back off every year to clean. When it's all done, there will be four screws that attach this face piece, but I'm only putting the upper two in for now until I have the floorboard in. Nothing stopping me from putting all four in on the back side though. You should have all sorts of pieces laying around if you're anything like me. Let's put it like this with the grain running up and down because we'll be screwing it from the side and it's best not to screw into end grain when you have the opportunity. I don't want to spend too much time on the details, but the idea here is to get water to run off and out the corners. For these two, I don't want to get too close to the end or else it'll split. I know I said Splitting is okay, but not with fasteners. You don't want anything to split around a fastener. Now, of course, don't use a bandsaw this way if you're not comfortable with it, but the idea here is to put a little bit of an angle on these end grains so that any water that sits up here goes off and out. Sharp corners, bad. Why? In case you're cutting the grass and you hit your head on it, just get rid of them. Time to cap this project off. But I'm gonna do a little bit of optional bandsaw work. For this next cut, I have to position myself behind the bandsaw, but after I make it, I'll show you how you can just do it with a utility knife. Okay. 
Uh, I'm coming in about three eighths of an inch. I'll aim this way and then I'll aim that way. This way first, that way second, this way, that way. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to make a little 45 degree channel so that, so that as water comes around this corner, it will get to the little channel, break its surface tension, and fall away. Sure, I can prove it to you. Just a little bit of remaining bark here. This material is quite a bit thicker than this is, so I will use two and a half inch screws, which are a little bit longer. When you want to recess a screw down inside, a 3 8 spade bit is a nice little way to do it. Make the tip point just a little bit out, and then feel around until it snaps into the hole. Back it out a little bit, and all the way down. How do you get this to hit the center of that? Well, it's tricky. You can measure, but you'll still be off. A human being's depth perception is pretty linear, and we have to remember that. So keep your eye this way, and then come over here and do it that way, perpendicular to that. Keep checking back and forth 90 degrees from one another. As long as you're correct in both of those directions at the same time, chances are you'll hit the bullseye. Okay, that's set number two done. The first set's already up, but I'll probably make one more set at least. Maybe a fourth if I have time, but I have a million other projects to get to. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you found something good in this, and I'll see you on the next project. Whenever you hang your bluebird box, predators are going to be a concern. It's inescapable. There's a lot of fear out there that using a tree is too dangerous because it invites snakes, raccoons, cats. In my own experience, growing up, for years we made birdhouses of all types, and only once did I ever see a snake in one, and it wasn't even a bluebird box. Nevertheless, my advice to you is to remain attentive, pay attention, and adapt to changing circumstances. For my use here, I think that the benefit to the bluebirds having many nesting options outweighs the unlikely possibility that a predator may get into one of these boxes eventually. Good luck out there.